if the wicked people, based upon what is prophesied, are going to spring into action to try to prevent those things that are prophesied, then how can the people of God, how can righteous people sit there and do nothing? Perhaps if the wicked people had a known, these disciples ain't going to do jack squat, then they'd have sat there and not done nothing. But they had thought, they had said, no, those believers are going to do something, so we ought to be ready for it. They didn't know y'all was just going to sit there. My wife said, uh, my wife said, if uh, you're not a real preacher, man, if you don't, you don't lay something down for uh, Christmas or Easter. So I just came um, to lay something down real quick, something important that I came across reading the scriptures. Uh, happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter, uh, by the way. Um, we'll get in and get out. And so let's just go straight to, uh, to uh, Luke, the end of Luke. Uh, chapter 24 and there's a story there that I wanted to highlight and in the story uh, the story is after Christ is crucified and um, he's crucified and they lay him into a, uh, a empty unused tomb and the story says that the uh, the two Marys and uh, Joanna had uh, come to the to the tomb and uh, they had brought spices with them. And when they got to the tomb, they had found it empty. And so I just wanted to give us a brief word, um, basically on degrees of faith. Degrees of faith is what we're talking about here on this Resurrection Sunday. And if you read that whole chapter 24, it basically gives case studies of different people and what they're doing around the time of the resurrection of Christ early on Sunday morning and what they're doing on Saturday night through Sunday morning. And uh, there's three that I want to talk about, maybe more, but this will be short. The first one is the women, uh, which are the two Marys and Joanna, who they say they went and gathered spices after they had observed the body being laid in the tomb, they went and gathered spices and they came back to the body. And they found that the body wasn't there. The other uh, case study is that of the disciples. And throughout these chapters, uh, chapter 24 in Luke and 23, and uh, they, the disciples are being depicted as basically sitting still and having doubt. They do nothing, they're gathered, they're huddled together in a place and they're sitting there, sort of just waiting, sort of just clueless, really doing nothing. And then if you go into Matthew, around the last chapters of Matthew, I think in Matthew 27, there's a third group, which is the chief priest and the Pharisees and Pontius Pilate. And what you will find is those guys are busy on Saturday night slash Sunday morning. And those guys are busy working. And what they have done is they have said, we have heard that this man is gonna be risen after three days. And we believe that based upon this fact, we ought to be doing something to prevent fraud. We ought to be doing something to prevent the fact of people knowing that, there, that this man and what he had prophesied, this son of God, as he claims that he had prophesied, is in fact risen. And so what we need to do is we need to launch a plan into action to make sure that the testimony, that the witness doesn't occur to the miracle. Here, um, when we examine these circumstances, I was talking about degrees of faith in this short one. Just to give us a little bit, light a little fire under, uh, behind our backs, those of us Christians, to really get out here and do the work. Recall that in James, it says that faith without works is dead. I stand behind that. That faith without works is absolutely dead. Because so many people 
are focused on the first words of Christ, where he says, what I need you all to do is to go around and talk about the forgiveness of sins and repentance. The forgiveness of sins and repentance. Well, what does that mean? Well, on Resurrection Sunday, we have a lot of people gathered together in a place and people gather together, and there's nothing wrong with gathering together to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But people are gathered together, and they're celebrating that because they're talking about the forgiveness of sins. You will hear people say, well, Jesus the Christ came, and he died for our sins, and I'm here to celebrate that fact. The only issue is... Though you can celebrate the forgiveness of the sins, which is the first part, though you should preach the forgiveness of sins, though you should go around and bear witness to people about the fact that their sins can be forgiven, why then do people need their sins forgiven? So that they can bear fruit worthy of repentance. So there's two parts to that. There's the forgiveness of sin, and then there's the repentance. So many people feel slowed down, they feel hampered down, they feel that heavy burden of the fact of, I've got mistakes in my past, I've got terrible things that I've done, and so therefore, I'm a stopped, I'm hindered from going forward and doing something great. So many people are coming across this Resurrection Sunday and saying that, uh, I want to do this or I want to do that. Perhaps I've been incarcerated, perhaps I've, I've hurt people. There's a number of letdowns that I've had that I haven't made good on certain things in my life. And because of that, I, I can't do this or I can't do that. I, I would like to do something great, but, you know, I don't know, because if I try to do something great, if I try to do a keeping of the sheep activity, then perhaps I'll be met with opposition and they'll bring up my past. Or, you know, I'm vulnerable because I, I've got sins in my past. Well, the point of the forgiveness of sins is to equip people, to help them to understand that if God has forgiven you, then you no longer have to think about the things of your past. All you have to do is move clean into the future and to start to do the keeping of the sheep activity without regard for your past mistakes. No, you should think about your past mistakes. That's a part of repentance. Think about it so that you understand where you don't need to go wrong anymore. But the other thing is to proclaim the coming of Christ. That is, I'm free from the burden of that. But from here on out, I'm going to live a life free of those mistakes as possible, as much as possible. And moving so hard into my purpose, so great into my purpose, such as to bear those fruit worthy of repentance. And a lot of what we're preaching today, it forgets about that second part, that one of the most important things is repentance. To, first of all, to apologize and talk with God. And then second of all, to get involved into that righteous action that shows the fact that I have repented, repented. That shows the fact that I'm so happy about being forgiven that I'm going to go out here and put some work down. And so we come back to those three parties and we see great examples of what to do and what not to do and what we're called to do. First. We have those who are supposed to be believers who spent a lot of time with Christ. And we find that in the aftermath, they haven't grown the way that they're supposed to. And it's going to take for Christ to reveal himself directly to their eyes for them to snap out of their funk. See, Christ is going to have to show himself directly to you in such a way to cause some of us to snap out of our funk. That we can just sit there and just think about the fact that he died. That we can even sit there and maybe celebrate the fact that he rose. But the fact of the matter is, like the disciples in the aftermath of the Resurrection Sunday, we're basically just sitting there. But what we need to do is spring into action because faith without works is dead. But then we have the second example. And so the disciples is where you don't want to go. But then we have an intermediate example, which is those women who gathered the spices. Well, they had witnessed the body of Christ being laid into the tomb. And so they said, we're going to prepare spices. What they had did was they had engaged in an act of compassion and love based upon what they had seen. But what they had heard, they hadn't come into full believing of. And so they went and got the spices because they saw the dead body, an act of compassion. And what the scripture is saying is, is that the Lord 
and that Christ can actually work with someone who does some type of act, even if they're not totally sure in their faith, even if their faith and their belief is not totally strong and complete, that if you are acting in love and compassion, that's something to work on. And that's why when the women get to the tomb, they find that it's empty. But in fact, the two that are sparkling, dazzling the angels, the people of God are there to remind them. Didn't he say he was going to be risen? And so then their, their faith is, be able, is able to be made whole. Their act of righteousness and love and compassion is turned into actual faith. This is why the scripture says about Abraham that his obedience was reckoned to him as righteousness. His action was reckoned to him as righteousness because he actually took an act based upon the small amount of faith that he did have, even though his faith wasn't completed. This is what we see people do in the interim, and this is our encouragement, that regardless of what you're going through, that you should spring into action based upon your love and compassion for others. Spring into action based upon your love and compassion for the people of this earth and the goodness of God, even though you may not be completely sure of everything that is going on, and that's the intermediate phase. Now I want to highlight for you the fact that those wicked people, the chief priest and the Pharisees sprung into action, though. They knew. They actually believed. They had some type of belief that something is going to happen around that third day and what he said. Either somebody's going to do a fraud or something's going to happen. And so we're going to have to spring forward to put some action into place. This is what they're talking about. And so I'm borrowing from that example to say that the righteous people of God ought to understand what the scripture is saying is that based upon your beliefs, if the wicked people based upon what is prophesied are going to spring into action to try to prevent those things that are prophesied, then how can the people of God, how can righteous people sit there and do nothing? Perhaps if the wicked people had to know, these disciples ain't going to do jack squat, then they'd have sat there and not done nothing. But they had thought, they had said, no, those believers are going to do something. So we ought to be ready for it. They didn't know y'all was just going to sit there. And so meanwhile, all the wicked people are springing into action and doing things. But righteous people are sitting there waiting, not sure. And so the encouragement on this Easter Sunday, this resurrection is that you were risen for a reason. Now, we don't believe in death, those of us at Christ. We, believe, we don't believe death like others believe it. And so the resurrection, you are risen. Oh, you, you are promised life for a reason. That is, that your faith can have action behind it. Happy Easter and God bless you. I love you.